Oh, um, glad to be here. Um, I have to tell you that Independent Institute and uh, National Association of Scholars have put together an incredible meeting. I'm really impressed with some of the people that I've met, with many of the people I've met in the audience. Um, for example, Jason Johnston from University of Virginia Law School came here, uh, not a speaker, just to observe what's going on. And he's um, very, well, very well accomplished in environmental law. And I think you got a lot of people at your meeting because it appears you have a picture of the coronavirus on your program. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, I also need to talk about um, my sympathetic bias beforehand, apparently. Um, I believe that the scientific basis underpin underpinning EPA's endangerment finding from carbon dioxide is much shakier uh, than is generally thought. And this talk uh, is a part of the reason why I have come to that conclusion. Because it will turn out that the climate science that it relies upon will not follow the normal rules of what we could s consider to be science in the following sense. A predictive science is verified by verifying a prediction. You have to make a prediction in order to be, and, and look at it in order to be able to judge whether the um, relevant theories that have gone into the prediction are correct. Simple example. I know why the woman's not here from North Carolina, because I looked at the uh, weather data the night before, night before last, and I said, oh my God, anybody that gets in an airplane on the East Coast is going to get kicked around terribly. And that's what happened to anybody who came across the country yesterday. I made a forecast, and it was predicted. I used the data. I used, I used the training that I've had. Uh, and so let's uh, see if that's really what's going on in climate science and policy. And the talk pro, uh, title is Climate Science, the Consequences of Irre Irreproducibility. Of course, each talk starts with crass commercial messages. And um, here is my new book, Scientocracy, uh, which is a book about systematic problems in science. The subtitle of the book is The Tangled Web of Public Science and Public Policy. And it touches on many of the subjects that were talking about at this meeting. Um, talk about how governments politicize the food that you eat. Did you know that the basic theory uh, behind um, radiation damage and health uh, is not correct? It's really quite remarkable. We cover that in this book. And how misuse of science affects property rights. Uh, it can affect drug research. It's everywhere, and that's why it spawned a 350-page, hopefully non-boring book. Now, let me start this talk off now talking about my field, um, and it's this. First of all, global warming is real, okay? Climate's not a stationary variable. Two things to note. This is the surface temperature record from the Hadley Center uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's from whence the climate gate emails were leaked. The, uh, there are two warmings in this record. The first one begins around 1910 and ends around 1945, and the slope of it is similar to one that begins around 1976 and attenuates somewhere here around the year 2000. And then the laser pointer isn't working. It's not absorbing on the screen? Yeah. Uh, all right, that's fine. <laughs> Okay, there are two warmings on this record. You can see the first one begins around 1910, ends around 1940, and then there's another one that begins around 1976, attenuates in the early, around, around the early 21st century, and it pops back up with the big El Nino of 2015 and 16. Uh, the second warming almost certainly has a strong greenhouse component, and that's because it is accompanied by something that Popper would call uh, a difficult prediction. Uh, the fact that gravity would bend light was a difficult prediction from Einstein, but it turned out to be true, as shown in the total eclipse of 1918. The fact that the stratosphere must cool while the surface warms 
is an outcome of greenhouse theory and conservation of energy. Putting CO2 in the atmosphere does not, repeat, does not increase the net energy of the Earth. It does not increase the overall temperature. So if it warms somewhere, and CO2 will warm the lower layers of the atmosphere, there's got to be a compensatory cooling, and you see it right there in the stratosphere. Okay, fine. All this is very good. So we have now, I have now claimed to, to um, embrace mainstream climate science. Now I'm going to show some problems that are going on in these fields. Here's the temperature record uh, that begins uh, in the late, late 1990s. And you can see somewhere there around the year 2000, all of a sudden this warming stops. Uh, and it begins to pick up again around 2013, 2014. Uh, that's not in the computer models. Um, however, in verifying theories, what happened when this became common knowledge in my field? We changed the data. And so if you look at the 2015 paper known as the Pause Buster paper that Tom Carl put in Science Magazine claiming a significant warming now existed at, at that point in time, significant at the point .10 level, I might add. What's that doing in Science Magazine? I do not know. Um, and then all the other people who put together temperature records adjusted their temperature records. The way it was done was we used to have satellite sense sea surface temperature records. Those were thrown out of this record. And instead, data were substituted from sh uh, ship cooling intake tubes. Everybody knows the ships warm up in the sun and that that record's not very good. But there was also an additional data set, drifting buoys, NOAA buoys around the planet that are calibrated. These, these are very good data. And there are more and more and more of them. So that should really make a much better record. Except that because of the problems with the ship data, all the buoy records were raised two tenths of a degree. So the more buoys that you have out there, the more warming you're going to put in that period. That happened, and that is unfortunately um, inherent in the science. Now, there are other records that aren't adjusted that don't show that pause. Here's the satellite record. This is actually the basically th five to 30,000 feet in the atmosphere. That pause is nowhere near as obvious in this record. So what do you do to verify a model? This becomes an increasingly difficult problem. And here's the U.S. Climate Reference Network in response to criticisms about urban heat islands and all that. We put out a record of really pristine stations that begin to take effect somewhere around 2004, uh, and this is it through 2019. And you can't see any warming in that whatsoever. However, if you look carefully, the y-axis is offset, so that is warmer than the previous data that's being uh, compared to in general but it's not warming. Now I gotta ask an impertinent question. Do climate scientists cheat? All climate models are tuned upon the 20th century temperature curve. They are tuned to simulate the first warming of the 20th century and the second warming of the 20th century. Uh, this came out in an article by Paul Vusen in Science Magazine on October 26th or 28th, I forget the date, 2016, right before the election. Uh, and indeed, uh, what it said was, indeed, whether climate scientists like to admit it or not, nearly every model has been calibrated precisely to the 20th century climate records. Otherwise, it would have wound up in the trash. Quote, it's fair to say that all models have tuned it, end quote, says Isaac Hell, the guy at GFDL in Princeton. Uh, for years, climate scientists had been mum in public about their so-called secret quote, secret sauce. What happened in the models stayed in the models. This taboo reflected fears that climate contrarians would use the practice of tuning to see doubt about the climate models. Well, at least Science Magazine made one good prediction. Uh, so, could the first warming of the 20th century be due to carbon dioxide? Let's just do a very simple mathematical derivation. 1910 carbon dioxide 
which is when the warming begins, is about 298 parts per million. It's generally accepted that the pre-industrial, for the purposes of this argument, was about 285 parts per million, but I'm going to take it to 279, the extremely conservative pre-industrial. And so you had a change of 13 parts per million in carbon dioxide, inducing a warming rate suddenly of about five tenths, four to 45 hundredths of a degree in 40 years. Uh, you can do the math. You can see what the carbon dioxide forcing is, uh, which would be about plus 0.35 watts per meter square. The negative sulfate forcing, that's the junk that we put in the air that, that counters this, was about 0.3, according to, to, to Bjorn Stevens, who is the authority on this. So your net forcing was 0.05 watts per meter squared. If for that change, which is one-tenth of a light bulb, one-tenth of a light bulb raised the surface temperature of the planet, 45 hundredths of a degree. Then the current concentration that we're at, around 410 parts per million, uh, would give us a warming of 2.83 degrees so far, Celsius. Just did not happen. So they can't simulate, they shouldn't simulate the warming of the early 20th century. Uh, when this all came to a head, the paper that Science Magazine is talking about was published by uh, Frederick Hordan in uh, the Journal of Climate in 2000, 2017, but it was accepted in 2016, and the news article in Science right before the election was from the papers that were circulating around the planet. Here is from the paper, called The Art and Science of Climate Model Tuning. With increasing diversity in the applications of climate models, the number of potential targets for tuning increases. There are a variety of goals for specific problems, and different models may be optimized to perform better on a particular metric related to specific goals, expertise, or the cultural identity of a given modeling group. Thank you, Frederick, for telling how it is. One can examine, he went on, changing a parameter which is known to affect the sensitivity. That's the amount of warming you get for changing carbon dioxide known to affect the sensitivity, keeping both this parameter and the equilibrium climate sensitivity within the anticipated acceptable range. Did you hear that? Anticipated acceptable range and returning the model otherwise to the same strategy towards the same targets. Translation, it is the scientist, not the science, that determines what is anticipated and acceptable. I've just told you the nice part of the story. Now I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> the unintended consequence of tuning is to make the models wrong because you're only tuning the surface temperature. And so as a result, uh, John Christie went to the great catalog of climate models that for the United Nations' latest report, the one that is about to be superseded by the next one. And I'll talk about that in a second. How much time do I have? Five. Um, and what he did was he looked at the tropical troposphere. This is the area between 20 north and 20 south. Uh, he looked at it, uh, the average from about five to 40,000 feet or 50,000 feet in the atmosphere. Uh, be careful because you're not going to believe the chart you're going to see. Uh, it is here. The red dot is the average change in all the 32 model groups in the UN report, 102 average, 102 runs. The lower plots, the squares, are the three satellite data average. Circles are the weather balloon data sets. Those weather balloons are calibrated every time they're launched. That's good data. Uh, and the diamonds are something called reanalysis data, which is a new fancy way to put data on Earth where there isn't not just extrapolating, but by using a physical model. You can see that uh, by around now, uh, they're predicting in the, in the upper troposphere there, or in the troposphere there, about 1.5 degrees of warming to take, have taken place, and you have about 0.5. Now let's divide this into the vertical. Did you say what year that starts in? Starts in 1980, which is when 1979, when the satellite begins to return data. 
uh, and uh, the data goes through 2016 in this particular f slide. If you want these images, I'll be happy to send them to the conference organizer. Uh, now let's go up in the atmosphere. Scientists would like to see the rates of, oh, let me, let me show you something interesting in this. Take a look. I'm going to have to step away from the mic. I'm sorry. I'll try and broadcast it a little bit. Each one of these colored spaghetti is an individual climate model. There is one piece of colored spaghetti that works. Now, if we were doing science the right way and policy the right way, this is the model that we would use. Call the special prosecutor because that's the Russian model. <laughs> now, now, let's take a look, not at this whole slab of the atmosphere, but let's look in the vertical where this is the surface, and this is about 30 to 40,000 feet in the atmosphere. These are the warming rates that are projected by the models and reality in degrees Celsius per decade. You can see here up around, this is a pressure height that corresponds to about 30 to 40,000 feet, that uh, the computer models, the black line solid, are predicting over four times as much warming as being observed four times as much in the upper tropical troposphere. How can this be? How can these predictions be so bad? Because they're not predictions. These models are not run in predictive mode. This is what the tuned models show after you tune the surface temperature to be correct. Um, this, there, th this was in two refereed papers. Uh, this is a third one that appeared with McKittrick a couple of months ago. This is at about 30 to 40,000 feet in the atmosphere. Same story. And one model, INMCM4, works. That's the model we should be using. But you know what the problem with it is? It has less warming than any of the other models. It has the least warming of all of them. It would kill the issue. My colleagues would have to fly and coach. God forbid. God forbid. And so, if we were doing normal science here, the next iteration of these models would correct this. Well, we now have the next iteration flowing in for the upcoming IPCC report that's coming out later this week. It's called the CMIP-6 suite of models as opposed to the CMIP-5 suite of models. Somebody ought to be correcting this. John Christie got the early data. This is not all the models, but it's about half of them missing one, which I'm going to finish on. Uh, and this is the warming predicted in that upper layer. Uh, the red line is the average. It's worse than CMIP-5. It's a bit warmer than CMIP-5, and we're hearing all these stories that the new models are going to predict even more surface warming than the previous generation, rendering them into the, the um, how should I put it? Nobody's going to listen, okay? Because they know that's just too darn hot. And so that's what we have. Now I will close. The guys at the Russian uh, uh, hydrology lab have also submitted an INMCM 4.8. The coolest model of them all in the last run had 2.05 degrees of equilibrium climate warming for doubling carbon dioxide. The new one? INMCM 4.8 has 1.8 degrees. It's cooler than the previous version. I really do think for all this we need a special prosecutor <laughs> and the special prosecutor ought to take a look at the endangerment finding. Thank you very much.